Yeah, it's me again. And uh, this is the first of our Hair Breath Harry comedies produced by the West Brothers, George and Billy West, for the Weiss Brothers, based on C.W. Kale's long-running and successful comic strip. Great melodramatic spoofs, uh, which I think are some of the better of the Weiss Brother product. And uh, they're just a little more elaborate, uh, great gags, just very entertaining films, as you can see. Here, ah, is the chief, Fred Lancaster. Now, a familiar face in some comedies. Played a lot of exotics. Worked with Larry Seaman in the early 20s. Probably his most famous role was in uh, the first film version of Kismet. Otis Skinner's Kismet, 1920, where he plays Zaire. But good at this kind of stuff. And, uh, like I said, you see him from time to time. Here's our first Belinda, <laughs> the heroine of the Hairbreath Harrys, who's going to change, I think, with every film. This is a gal named Erin LaRue. Got nothing on her, folks. Sorry. Uh, if you know something about her, you can write and tell me all about it. Here's Jack Richardson, great uh, Senate supporting comic of the 20s, and one of his best roles playing the relentless Rudolph, the villain, the top hatted villain, an extremely tall top hat. <laughs> <laughs> there, I think, I think they actually uh, took the top of another top hat, stuck it on there, and wrapped some fabric around it. But uh, that great thing. Here's Earl McCarthy, our good guy, Hairbreath Harry, who is Hairbreath Harry in, I think, all of the comedies that were produced by the West Brothers for the Weiss Brothers. And uh, again, sort of a uh, played a lot of you know college guys, that sort of thing. Not, uh, it worked, worked in some comedies, um, Universal, but these were, these were his biggest shot. He died, tragically, uh, rather young at the age of, when was he, uh, I think he was 30. He was, not died in May 28, 1933, and I think he was only about, uh, 26 or 7, sadly, but, uh, does a great job. See, a lot of a lot of fun wacky gags here. Uh, this these, this looks like more like the Glendale area now. Is a big question. I think the West Brothers shot these more in the Indale Glendale area, and, uh, with a little higher budgets than you would see in, in some of the other Vice product. Uh, Richardson here is probably the busiest of the Rudolphs. I think he played Rudolph in of these than any of theirs, but again, the cast tended to change. Sometimes it was Jack Cooper, who was another Senate comic, uh, and as we'll see in the third film, we're showing Rudolph's Revenge, sometimes it was played by Jimmy Aubrey, but uh, Richardson was a Brit, music hall, comedian, came over here sometime, I think, in the teens, worked uh, for Chaplin, worked at Vitagraph, for Senate, worked in the Fox Sunshine comedies, 1917-18, worked for Hank Mann in his Arrow comedies, done for more Schlank, uh, independent comedies in 1919-1920, uh, worked at Roach for a while, worked all over the place, but most, mostly at the uh, Senate, and these are probably some of the best roles that he played. Uh, he, was a, he was a very good Rudolph, and... Uh, I think this is probably what he most remembered for. Died in 1942, sadly. Um, made a lot of talkies, though. Appears in a lot of bit parts in Cecil B. DeMille pictures. Uh-oh, here comes Perry Murdoch, who started as a comedian. Worked at uh, Bray, another independent Bray company, which was a, actually a cartoon company that made some live-action films in the mid-20s. But uh, later really was much, much busier as a set decorator and assistant director, second unit director, worked in a lot of B-Westerns, but got into set decoration, art direction, in television, really, in the 50s, 60s, uh, worked into the 70s, basically passed away in 1988, so he had a long, varied career. Now, the... Uh, Hairbreath Harry series, as I said before, these were based on a very popular comic strip that was 
was drawn by a uh, cartoonist named C.W. Kales. A uh, little background on Kales. Uh, again, very famous early cartoonist. Born January 12, 1878. Died January 21, 1931. Well-known newspaper cartoonist was actually born in Bavaria. Came to America at the uh, tender age of six with his family. Studied art at the Pratt Institute in the Brooklyn Art School. Went to work again at a rather tender young age for the New York Recorder and the New York Journal as a staff artist at the age of 16. Before the, even the turn of the 20th century, he was hired by our, the New York World, 1898, uh, creating some famous early comic features like Little Red Schoolhouse, Billy Bounce, Pretending Percy, and one of the first police comic strips, Clarence the Cop. His uh, strip Sandy High Flyer, the airship man, even predates the Wright Brothers, came on the scene in the papers in 1902. Deborah Harry premiered in the Philadelphia Press October 21st, 1906, originally called Our Hero's Hairbreath Escape. It was changed the following January 1907 to Hairbreath Harry the Boy Hero. Harry's actually first a kid, but uh, I think that possibilities in that were a little more limited. And Harry grew up quickly when Belinda Binks, the lovely heroine, was introduced as the beautiful Boilermaker heroine in uh, September of 1907. Rudolph was actually introduced to the strip in March of 07. I guess they needed someone for him to terrorize, which is why Belinda came along. Rudolph's full name Relentless Rudolf Rodegor Rassendale, Relentless Rogue. Forget the R's there. But uh, basically, this setup, the classic melodrama, top hatted villain, harassing beautiful heroine, saved by the not quite a boy hero anymore, was actually one of the first strips to develop a continuing story, uh, being produced serially uh, every Sunday. Weekly through uh, the, about 1915, when the Philadelphia Press got out of the syndicating business, and uh, Kales quickly ended the strip, I guess, without a lot of, of notice, uh, with the Harry and Belinda tying the knot. However, seven months later, Kales revived the strip from the McClure Syndicate, uh, annulled the marriage, and uh, Harry and Belinda claimed that their wedding was just a, uh, literally, a mere rumor spread by a lazy cartoonist, and uh, things continued as they always had, with Rudolph relentlessly pursuing Belinda. Deborah Harry moved to the Ledger Syndicate in 1923, still an incredibly successful strip, very popular. It became a daily strip at that point, also continuing the weekly panels, but uh, Gales kept up doing this strip, and it was still popular by the time he died in 1931. It was uh, continued after his death, taken on by an artist named Etho Alexander, who continued it through the 30s, giving it up in 1939, and some various staff artists continued it until the following year, when it uh, finally ended. It's funny, a lot of people think that sort of the spoof of melodrama started with Max Sennett in the teens when he was already, you know, doing things with top-headed villains and tying, you know, Gloria Swanson to the railroad track like uh, Wallace Beery did in Teddy to the Throttle. But no, this this goes way back to Hairbreath Theory. I think the melodrama basically <laughs> was a cliche from the day it was born. And, uh, you know, this, this, this kind of thing which became a mainstay of, of serials, also uh, became a mainstay of jokes. That's an interesting big rock. I wonder if that's one of uh, Buster Keaton's paper mache rocks from uh, Seven Chances. Those things seem to get rented out quite a bit <laughs> all through you know, the, the years. But uh, the Herbert Harry comedies, again, were one of three series produced for the Weiss Brothers by the West Brothers along with the Winnie Winkle and Izzy and Lizzie series. And, uh, as I said, the West Brothers were Billy and George West. Billy West was indeed the comedian and chaplain impersonator who uh, had been making pictures for over a decade at the 
this part. His real name is Roy B. Weisberg. He was actually originally born in Russia, September 22nd, 1892. He was brought to this country uh, with his family when he was two and a half years old, raised in the Chicago area. He had been working in vaudeville for a number of years and the end of the teens. He was doing a chaplain impersonation because he was very physically similar uh, to Chaplin. Had some success with that. He was brought to movies by the Unicorn Film Service in 1916 uh, to put his Chaplin impersonation in two reelers. Unicorn made three before they went out of business. He made one more for sort of a reorganized version of Unicorn called the Belmont Film Company before it too folded. Then Billy West was hired by King B, formerly the Cause Comedy Corporation. 1970 to make two reelers that uh, were shot first down in that busy film capital of the teens, Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, here West actually found a, a pretty good degree of success uh, in uh, these pictures, which were directed by uh, comedy director Arvid Gilstrom. West was supported by Oliver Hardy, of all people, very young Oliver Hardy. Jacksonville with Lubin Company until Lubin had folded and after bouncing up and down the East Coast doing some work came back to Jacksonville to work for the Vim Company and then uh, when Vim went under he went to work for King B and uh, supported West quite successfully in uh, a number of King B pictures in 1917-1918. Uh, West's Chaplin impersonation is so successful I mean, it's so successful that even today, sometimes you'll see Billy West footage in comedy compilations being listed as Chaplin. But uh, it was so good that Chaplin complimented it rather than suing him, as he did Billy Ritchie and a number of the other Chaplin impersonators. And uh, so West was considered the top Chaplin impersonator in his field. And believe it or not, in the late teens, there <laughs> there was competition for that title. King B moved around a bit. Uh, they left Jacksonville in late 1917, went to Bayonne, New Jersey, shot some pictures, ended up in Hollywood uh, before West actually got ill uh, due to the influenza epidemic in 1918. And unfortunately, King B folded soon after that. They reorganized as a company called Bullseye in 1919. And once West was well enough, he came back and went to work for Bullseye under the direction of Charlie Chase, Charles Parrott as he was known as a director. There was some disagreement though with Bullseye. West made about five pictures for them before he left uh, in a huff, and uh, or a minute and a huff as Groucho would say, and uh, forced them to put actually a Billy West impersonator <laughs> and a guy named Harry Mann was impersonating Billy West, impersonating Chaplin. It starts to get a little confusing, but uh, they did that for a while. Um, West sued them, kind of went back and forth. Ooh, God. McCarthy and Greg. I just kind of... That is a little frightening. Um, but, in, but anyway, West never went back to Bullseye. He made some pictures for Real Craft, which was actually a company that had swallowed up Bullseye and some other companies. He was an independent producer. He made another series for Joan Film Sales, 1921. And around that time, dropped the Chaplin impersonation. Uh, basically started doing what some said was a Monty Banks impersonation. But he was working at basically in sort of his own portrayal. In 1922, started making comedies for an independent distributor called Arrow uh, under his own production company, Cumberland Productions. And he made comedy starring himself. He made some with Bobby Ray. Uh, Oliver Hardy came back and worked for them for a while. Uh, he worked for them producing comedies quite successfully until 1926 when Arrow folded. So then West, along with his brother George, decided to uh, seek financing from the Weiss brothers to make uh, these three comedy series based on the comic strips Air Breath Harry, which again was based on C.W. Kale's strip. Winnie Winkle, which starred Ethlyn Gibson, who was West's wife at the time, which was based on Martin Branner's comic strip of the same name. And then the Is in Lizzie series. The original contracts on all of the Billy West, West Brother activity, the Weisses, actually survive. 
in the Weisbrot files, and uh, quite interestingly, um, sort of gives you some background into how the Weisses handled their financing and how the West Brothers dealt with it. Uh, they entered into their first agreement with the Weiss Brothers on March 23, 1926. The contract uh, stipulates that the West Brothers agreed to deliver 12 pictures each of the three series, a total of 36 comedies. The Weiss Brothers secured a loan for the West Brothers of $4,000 per picture from Consolidated Film Industries to finance those pictures. Now, Consolidated, of course, was Herbert Yates's uh, laboratory, very successful laboratory business in both Hollywood and New York. It was actually financing a lot of independent production at the time. Of course, in the 30s, Yates ended up uh, consolidating, I think, a lot of the producers that he was financing into Republic Pictures, but at this point, uh, Consolidated was underwriting people like Ray Johnstone and Trem Carr and the Weiss Brothers, uh, and the Weiss Brothers, among others, uh, to make low-budget independent pictures, and of course all the lab work went consolidated. But uh, in any event, that was the first contract. So these comedies being produced on a $4,000 budget, that's actually that's, that's a, a decent budget for a Weiss Brother comedy. Uh, I think Snub Pollard was producing his at the time uh, with a little more money, but you know, these, again, the Weiss Brothers were used to producing low-budget B-Westerns on $5,000 budgets. So you're seeing, see, you know, a decent amount of money. You're seeing, you know, the, like you see, elaborate sets and uh, you know, some, some pretty intricate gags. And it looks like we are just coming upon another comedy film uh, milestone area. This is the famous cliffs, the Pacific Palisades out near Santa Monica and, uh, on the coast where all the comedy companies would hang comedians, cars, you name it, off of those cliffs. I guess there was nothing underneath, you know, including traffic, but these are, uh, these, like Echo Park, this was, this was a comedy standard, a place that uh, all the uh, comedians uh, got their baptism by fire. Oh, here they go. Somehow, I doubt that's Aaron LaRue. That may be why we don't know much about her. And that car goes right over. It has to be early in the morning. <laughs> I mean, that was a, that's an actual road. You can, those cliffs are still there. So, uh, I seem to think the police would get upset about them dumping cars off those cliffs. But it was a, it was a regular occurrence. And it looks like we come to the end, so I'll have to continue this in the next film. We'll see you there.